Catholic for whom there is very little chance, quite frankly. The prognosis is bleak indeed, unless he has a fundamental moral psychological revolution. Q, James, right, and religious experience, etc. etc. They then go on and say, How on earth are you going to get that? And he says, I'm, he, I paraphrase, and I'm, he worked from very Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Carl Jung says, Well, you've got a few quid, go and buy a religion. <laughs> uh, and that's where the Oxford group comes in. Classic. That's where the Oxford group comes in. And that's where the spiritual malady comes in and the <coughs> origin of the notion of addiction having a spiritual element. So that's what we're rediscovering in all this. The question for us, though, is where do we find this recovery stuff then? So if I'm coming out of a railway station that I'm not familiar with and I'm looking for recovery, will it be signposted? <laughs> or wh where would I go and look for it? Well, you could be forgiven for going and looking for it in treatment. You could think, well, where's the local treatment service? I'll go there. The question is, what will you find there? Will you find recovery, or will you find active addiction with the harms being minimised, which is fantastic and not so much needs that, but, or, or will you find recovery? Because in most places, the proposition is that you're more likely to find active addiction as a feature of the treatment world, as it currently is, than you're going to find recovery. So there's a signposting issue, there's a branding issue of where you will find this, this thing called recovery. And that means for commissioners who are involved in this business, it's the building of bridges. Because both these places exist. If it's only a single-handed GP writing a prescription for methadone or benzodiazepines on his own, or, her, or her own, there will be treatment. If there's only a man, a woman, a big book, a resentment and a teapot in a basement somewhere, there will be a meeting. Yeah? The question is, do they speak to each other? Is there a bridge from one to the other? Because if there's not, then build one. And, it, and once you build it, make sure it's a busy bridge. There's lots of traffic going one way. And indeed, it can go both ways. Because some people who go to the world of recovery find it all a bit technical. And we don't want us to be relapsing and coming back in via jail. So build a bridge, make it busy, make it go both ways. And also build a bridge from jail. Because an awful lot of people, when you take people's narratives now, how did you get to the land of recovery and settle in the land of recovery, where did your journey begin? A lot of people, it began in prison. Uh, so we need to keep sure, make sure that we've got the, uh, the prisons involved as, as, key, as a key conduit, a key place where people can set sail to the land of recovery. So I'm going to race through these next bits now because I think the rest of it should start to unfold naturally now. We should begin, hopefully begin to see the links with Robbie's stuff as well. So fundamentally this notion of I can't but we can. Recovery champions, and crucially, George de Leon's piece for the academics among you, this notion of community as method, where coming together with other people actually becomes the method in itself, whether it's 12-step, whether it's smart, whether it's a therapeutic community, whether it's all the kind of arrangement, but coming together with other people to formulate a new identity. <coughs> That's what it's all about, a new lifestyle and a new identity. So, if active addiction is all about me, 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 if active addiction is self-will run riot, and it's a dark and lonely place where I'm likely to be the victim, and I'm likely to say, poor me, poor me, poor me a drink, yeah, which all too often happens in that dark and lonely place, then recovery is the flip side of that. It's about people coming together to share their experience, strength and all, and realising that they can do things together that they can't do alone. And then my recovery becomes your recovery, and we all start, you get that community as method thing, where... Uh, there's a great, George always talks about, one of the Americans talks about, if you look at an American redwood tree from a distance, of even close up, sorry, it looks like a majestic, massive thing, that it, and it looks like it's done it on its own. How's that tree grown to be that massive on its own? However, if you pan back, you'll find there's another one there, another one there, another one there, because all the roots are, under, are interwoven underneath, you can't see them. And that's how, that's the same kind of notion of people coming together, linking your recovery with other people. <coughs> Ultimately, to change your lifestyle and, and change your identity. The job for treatment, in, in, I work for the National Treatment Agency, I don't work for the National Recovery Agency. The job for treatment then is to get as many people as want to be yeah, out of treatment, into treatment, do the treatment to them, and then move them out. And move them out to the land of recovery, because that's where the, the rest of their lives will be spent. If you, um, a colleague of mine likens it to, if the, if the recovery journey is like a train from... Um, Manchester to London from here, then the treatment bit is the taxi to Piccadilly. Yeah, that's the treatment bit. Now that's that's a massive message for people like me because I, I this is all brand new to me. I'm I'm a, I'm a latter day student of recovery. I thought we did everything, treatment. You know, my my I, I thought we did everything. So to be told actually no no you do your bit well and then you prepare people to emigrate to the land of recovery or go across that bridge. That's your piece. Then you discharge your moral and professional and ethical duty. Yeah, there'll be some people who don't want to leave and we look after them as well. 
yeah, that's fine. But for those who want to leave, and remember, when we used to, the NTA used to do the survey, 80% year on year said they wanted to be abstinent. 80% said they wanted, in fact, they said it so many times we stopped asking them. Because you know, it was boring getting the same question. <laughs> uh, so 80% of people said they wanted to leave. Now, whether they knew what they were really saying, and whether we should expect numbers like 80%, but the Americans talk about 57% of people will, will recover. Da, da, da. So we're talking significant numbers of people who will make the journey. But what you're asking people to do, in, it's easy for me to stand up here and say, so make the journey, man, get across the bridge, you know, go and set sail for that. Hang on a minute. You're asking me, you asking me seriously if I'm a died in the wool, methadone maintained, classic social excluded addict, blah blah. You're asking me to give up. Get out of my bed. There's my. This is my lifestyle now. Lifestyle of addiction. Get out of bed. Dinner time ish. Pick up your methadone. Get the white cider. Get the benzos. Get your benefits and check out Jeremy. <laughs> if that's the lifestyle of active addiction, you're asking me to give up that. Are you seriously asking? Are you seriously asking me to give up that, which might not be pretty from where you are sat, but it's all I've ever done. You're asking me to give up that for that, an alarm clock. Get out of bed. Look after me kids. Me look after my kids. Well, that's a state's job, isn't it? That's not the wife's job. It's not mine. You know, anyway. Get out of bed, alarm clock, look after the kids, pay the rent, pay the rent, get over. Get a job, me, the 13th Earth of doing nothing. Get a job, I have absolutely preposterous idea. And go to these bloody meetings morning, noon, and night. Hang on a minute, let's just go back over that bridge, don't we? I, I just put it by me again. You're not selling this to me, Mark. <laughs> but that's what we're doing. That is exactly what we're doing. And we're doing it in an economic climate that's not favourable. And yet, people are doing it. People are having it. You know, even when it means giving up an incapacity, but which they've worked so hard to get. <laughs> you know, it's not nice. It isn't nice having to go to Bolton, to that doctor, time after time, and tell them that they can't possibly carry five pound of spuds home from Asda. And let alone tie your own shoelaces. Come on. You asked me to give all that up for that. Yes. Why? Because A, it's the right thing to do, and B, you could be the firewall in the intergenerational transmission. And what would you rather have on your tombstone? Here he is, lying in bed watching Jeremy. Or there he is, he was the one who stopped this family having this condition passed down its generation. What do you want, would you rather have? Your gyro and your white cider? Or on your, here lies a man, or at least give it a whirl. You know, here lies a woman who tried to create, who, who's, who was determined that her or his history would not be his or her destiny. They give it a whirl, they give it a shot. And that's what I mean by real recovery. And it's not going to be easy, and it's risky. And that's not, you know, and the, I work for the NHS, we don't do risk, we're not good. I mean, I go to an NA meeting, open an NA meeting, I listen to that, I'm not a recovery myself. If I go to an NA meeting, I want to know if we've done a safety check on the coffee pot. <laughs> because in, in my DNA, my DNA is about risk aversion. If somebody falls over, I'm not getting sued. No, it's not. And, and when I've been to the States looking at these recovery centres, time and time and time again, they have to remind me, it's not to do with you. But, I, but I, you know, I'm the man with the... Yeah, it's nothing to do with you. This is, how, this is us as adults. And if he falls over the copper pot or scalds himself, he falls over the copper pot and scalds himself. Nothing to do with you. You're not going to get sued. Stop worrying about it. But I, it's hard for me to, to get a grasp of that. A grasp of that. So, nailing it down even further, uh, in terms of right living, this is George de Leon again. Recovery beliefs and values. So what are, we, what are you asking us to do now? So we've got out of bed, we've got, they've done all this stuff, and now you don't stop, you're still on us. Yeah. Truth and honesty. What are the values that, re, that, that define recovery? Truth and honesty. A work ethic. The here and now. <coughs> the power of now. Eckhart Tolle. The power of now. Unites prince and pauper. You know, blah, blah, blah. The only thing that any of us ever, ever have, rich man, poor man, Prince, Queen, blah, 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 is now. This moment. Yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery. All we ever, ever have is now. So do the right thing now. Be aware of now. And be present for other people now. <coughs> Personal responsibility for your, for, for your destiny. Be the revolution you want to see. I think it was Gandhi 
who said that. Social responsibility, yes, be your brother's and sister's keeper, because it'll keep you well as well. And an unashamedly moral code of right and wrong behaviour. Bear in mind, George de Leo, this is, I've pulled this out of a massive tome, so maybe it all thinks, oh, hang on, where's he coming from? You can, you can, you can see the, the context, context for it. And George again saying, the inner person is fundamentally, George's belief, and I'm sure, is that the inner person is fundamentally good, even when their behaviour is bad. Yeah? So the inner person is fundamentally good. And then the community as method is how we learn that. The community as method is what teaches us to use the community to live right. And then, maybe, <coughs> maybe, that what we're asking people to do is to emigrate from this familiar land of treatment and active addiction, blah, 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 to this bright new world of recovery. And all we would ask, uh, if you do emigrate, just send a postcard back to the people who kept you alive and out of prison mm -hmm. for long enough to hear the message. Because there is a tendency in early recovery, and I can understand why, to say, you know, they kept me locked in methadone for 25 years. Well, I, nobody poured it down your neck. You know, I mean, all right, they might have, they might have not showed, given you as much encouragement not to do it, but it's done now. Yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery. We only have now, for the same was it for a postcard, 20p and... For less than a knicker, send them a postcard back and say thanks. It's just, it just, it's a, it's a noble thing to do, uh, and it would. And, and it, when Rowdy Yates always asked me to say that because when we used to work at Lifeline, he always used to moan because Phoenix House used to get the Christmas cards, and we <coughs> never did. Even when, we, we, even when we, we were the ones who did the stomach pumps when they were still using on Jodrell Street. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just a bit of a. You might choose not to. But anyway. The other thing that I've been doing is to uh, collect the thoughts of some of these. Elder statesman of recovery, so you know, George de Leon. Uh, this is from Clancy, Clancy I, some of you will know, uh, who in one of his talks last year, somebody asked him, What's your message for the world, Clancy? What's the message you want to tell the world from a, a lifetime of recovery yourself and as a, as a top table circuit AA speaker? And he tell them this, tell them that recovery does slowly what drink and drugs did fast. Because for people who are addicts and alcoholics, the notion of deferred gratification doesn't sit easily. Yeah, yeah? we want it now. There's a book, new book in the States called, uh, what's it called? Uh, Delusional Entitlement Disorder. I don't know what I want, but I want it now. I want the best and I want it free. Somebody's to blame. <laughs> so basically what, uh, what Clancy's saying is, remind people, it's not going to be easy. It is risky. It's not going to be easy, you know, turning around years and years of being at it to not be uh, will be difficult. Another point from Clancy, of course, is that when you're speaking to people and you're not sure if they're an alcoholic or an addict, particularly now in the reference in terms of 12 steps, uh, and the 12 step it is to basically give them the book, read, read from the forward to page 164, and see if you can find yourself in there. Because one of the things that he said is, a lot of people get this stuff wrong, they, get, they expect people to get on with 12 steps when they're not really addicts, and they're not really alcoholics as defined in the book. The 12 step program really is for people who define, who are in inverted commas, real alcoholics and slash real addicts. Um, 